Duncan, Francis, and to your dancers, oh, amazing. I'm so glad you guys were here and you're able to lift everybody's hearts up and now it's for me to depress everybody. <laughs> uh, thank you for building that goodwill <laughs> so people wouldn't leave this room crying. Uh, <laughs> because I'm about to trace the history of why good people do evil things. Uh, a very depressing topic indeed. Um, <laughs> but before I do, before I do, um, I would like to begin my speech in the following way. I begin with gratitude and acknowledgement heavy on my tongue for the traditional custodians of this living land on which we gather. I pay my respects not out of protocol, but out of the self-evident truth that their culture surrounds us informs us and indeed is an integral part of what it means to be Australian. So for this reason and so many other reasons, I pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people, the elders both past and present, and to all other indigenous peoples present in this room. I pay my respects to you for many, many personal reasons and for those big reasons. So thank you for that. My story and the story of um, how we came to be really begins probably about 200 million years ago. Um, that's when mammals first uh, arrived. Uh, we didn't do very well. Uh, for a long time we struggled. But one thing that set us apart was our mums. We as mammals, we had fantastic mums. And as the millennia just rolled on, our mums got better and better at being mums to the point where we see these amazing creatures who give so much without getting a single dollar back. It's amazing. Nature has created an amazing thing. Uh, but in particular, their, their story is the reason why we are the way we are today. About 3.3 million years ago, we lost our fur. Well, at least most of us did. There's still some of us. The only word I can use to describe this is a Persian carpet. <laughs> The only, that is the only word that comes to mind. Uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, that's why we still have the grasping reflex, because the little babies, they still want to grasp onto the fur. Uh, fascinating. So it's still a little bit of a vestige of our past is still in there. Um, so early in our hominin um, period, uh, we roamed as small hunter-gatherers. Uh, we weren't particularly successful. And about 1.8 million years ago, according to um, some really prominent evolutionary biologists, about 1.8 million years ago, something radical happened. Something extraordinary happened. See, before this, right, we could, we could learn by imitation. Before this, we had, we had capacity for a rudimentary form of culture. But something amazing happened. There was a woman, a mother, who gave birth to this baby. And all her life, she had this inkling. She somehow knew. She had this mutation in her brain, this new neural capacity to look at someone and decipher, are they going to help my baby or are they going to harm my baby? So you see, before this, chimp mums, a gorilla mums, even till this day, are both hyper-possessive and hyper-vigilant with their babies. So they carry around their babies everywhere they go with them. It's not that there aren't carers around. It's just that they don't trust them to look after the baby. So what happens is they carry it around, they pick the berries, and it's a very energy-consuming thing. Whereas this woman, about 1.8 million years ago, she would have been able to do this. Here you go. Hold on to this baby. I'm going to go and pick some berries. <laughs> Suddenly, for the first time, she didn't have to walk around with a baby. The energy advantage of this was profound. Profound. It takes about 18 million calories to raise a human being up to the age of 18. That's a lot of calories if he's also on your back, too. <laughs> and suddenly, this, this particular mutation was so incredibly advantageous. And slowly, that, those genes were passed on, and they started taking a life of its own. The reason for that is it became an extraordinary capacity to cooperate, and it actually gave rise to what we call theory of mind. Theory of mind is simply this idea that I can, just from looking at your body language, right, your face, I can decipher quite accurately, what you're thinking. I know there is a conscience, conscious human being inside there. I know that, just like me. And if I can know that, then what we can do for the first time is we can share an intention. We can share a conscience, conscious intention with one another. And this gives rise to shared intentionality. Suddenly, we can cooperate on a whole new level because we can plan. 
and you can suddenly understand the importance of language in this. Because if I know that you're thinking and they all know I'm thinking and they we can slowly start to communicate in more sophisticated ways. We don't have to rely on pheromones. We don't have to rely on chemicals. We don't have to rely on rudimentary body gestures. We can start to get really sophisticated using this, this voice box here. So all of this led to this incredible evolutionary arms race. So who could have the biggest frontal lobe to understand the other person? Because the better that we could understand one another, the better we could perform in that sociality, right? And the better our whole tribe did. So suddenly, the capacity to know another person's mind and work with them, but not be exploited. See, that's the thing. If you can read someone's mind better than they can read yours, you're now at a disadvantage of being exploited. So the bigger the frontal lobe you have, the better capacity you can read another's mind, the better you will do. And can I just have a look at the time, Father Richard? Um, Okay, good. So, from <laughs> so this gave rise to an incredible capacity for the human brain. That's why our, we have these fat, juicy frontal lobes that we do. It's not for the physical world. It's actually to understand one another. And we started becoming such fantastic um, cooperators that we could start going after big game. We could start going after the big stuff. And we started doing really, really well. We started doing really, really, really well. And in this process, in this process, we started spreading out. And then this is the, this is the bit where I'm relying more on conjecture and where we can sort of decipher from the archaeological record. Okay, this bit is me putting my two cents in there. This bit is, may very well be wrong, but this is the central thesis. And I'll explain why this is so important to empathy. So you had this capacity to read another person's mind, and you have this amazing ability to cooperate with one another, you don't want to be exploited by another person, so you develop sophisticated tools of keeping people who are cheaters in line. And that gives rise to a whole other set of cognitive abilities. So you start spreading out on the, uh, this African savannah, and you start being really, really successful. Problem is now, problem is, you have very, very successful tribes over there, and you have very, very successful tribes over here. What happens when resources become scarce? The competition is no longer with the physical environment, but with other human groups. Okay. Let me pause the story there. Let me pause the story there, and let's go back and break down some of the concepts um, that I'm going to be explaining to you guys today. The, uh, the concept of empathy is one we can readily understand. It has two components to it. There is the cognitive component, that is to say I look at you and I can understand what you're thinking, but there's also an affective component to it as well. I look at you and I know what you're feeling. So this is both feeling and thinking component to it. But very, very importantly, I can decipher those feelings, I can know those thoughts, and yet still somehow know that they belong to you and not me. So the self and other do not, although they can, do not mingle. And the, way, the reason why we can do this is because of this profound neural capacity we call mirror neuron theory. And it's quite a simple concept. Uh, you can best understand it as catch and match. Okay? Catch and match. So what happens is you catch an emotional state, you catch a certain amount of certain features, certain bod bodily expression, and then your brain matches it. That is to say the very same regions in your brain also fire off too. That's how you can understand another person's inner thoughts inner feelings, because those parts of your brain are also firing, firing off. And yet, magically, your brain also knows you're not actually going through that. You're only vicariously experiencing it through the other person. That's why the self and the other remain apart. And there is really two, two levels to empathy. And this is why I, I, this speech has been titled The Dark Side of Empathy. The first level of empathy is a very superficial kind of empathy. It's the kind of empathy that we have when we watch a really good movie and we cry, or a really good book and we cry. We cry for the characters in there. Um, for example, you know the twins that died in Harry Potter, one of the twins in the last book? A lot of people cried. But they weren't real. <laughs> they weren't real people. And yet we have a profound capacity even to empathize with them. But we close the book, our tears dry off, and that's about it. Because we know they're not real. Suspension of disbelief can only take us so far. And we forget about it. And then there's a second level of empathy. And I call this self-orientated empathy. 
And it's the kind of empathy that we feel when we're walking down the street and we see a homeless person and for a moment we just feel it. We project ourselves in there into their mind and just for a moment we feel what it would be like to be on that cold concrete. We feel what kind of thought, we just extrapolate what kind of thoughts of loneliness, of a sense of unwantedness, of being invisible. And it's terribly, terribly difficult to deal with. And what we do is we just tend to reach into our pockets really, really quickly and throw it there and then walk away. And then we forget about it. And there's almost this cathartic moment when we put a few coins down. But this type of empathy is deeply problematic. F one thing, you would only put those coins down if you were walking on that side of the road that he was on. If you're on the other side of the road, have you ever seen someone cross the road, put some money for the homeless person, then cross back the road to the other side? <coughs> Nobody does that. Well, I've never seen that. So even if when there's a tiny little bit of a personal cost to empathy, we're able to shut it off. We see him on the other we see the homeless person on the other side of the road, and we go, I can't cross the road and come back. And then we just walk on. So as soon as you introduce a tiny personal cost, it kind of dissipates. The second is, the second thing is, if that person exhibits a social marker that you find threatening, you find dangerous, or as part of a group that you don't think you belong to, you are far less likely to go up and pay that person. And conversely, if that person has social markers that you deem yourself to belong to, or social markers that you think you exhibit to, you're far more likely to actually go up and put a few, a few cents in there. So if they're part of the in-group, you're far more likely to help. If they're part of the out-group, then there's another component to this empathy that's really, really difficult, another one. And this is called situational transferability. I think I just made that up. I don't know whether people actually call that or not, but I just made it up. It sounds good. Um, and this, this, ex this I saw when I was watching uh, the Iraq war with my friends, actually. I remember seeing the, the images of the Ir Iraq war and then the subsequent uh, tragedy after tragedy. And my friends are deeply empathetic human beings, deeply empathetic human beings. Um, and yet, they used to watch the, these, these terrible bombings in these markets and these bazaars. 40 people, how are we doing for time? Oh, gotta hurry up. Uh, 50 people, 60 people, 100 people die from these bombings. Children, women, innocent people. And yet, we just f turn it off. And I just, it, it astounds me that we can, we can do that. We can just flick a switch and turn it off. A hundred human beings just died. So what's going on there? Are these are my friends bad people? No, they're actually not. They have a profound capacity for empathy. Problem is, they could never see themselves in a Baghdad market. They could never see themselves as one of those people who would go to that market because they live here in Australia. There's no situational transferability. Flip that on its head. When we have a bushfire here in Australia, all Australians pitch in. Even people who don't have much send whatever they can to those areas affected by bushfire. We do it. Profound sense of empathy. And the reason for that is because we can see ourselves in that situation. That could be us. We see ourselves right next. We could potentially be one of those people right next to those burning rubbles from bushfire. And and the other problem is the other problem is this with this kind of empathy. Um, imagine, uh, imagine I said this to you. Just take this. Today, fifty children will die because they don't have hand hygiene. Simple as a soap will save their life. That gets us. You feel it. You're like that's fifty lives I could save just with a bar of soap. Now what if I was to tell you the real number is actually 5,000 kids? Do you feel any worse? Does your pain, the empathy, the sense of profound loss do you feel, does it magnify by that number? I think somebody once said, one dead is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. And there is something to that. Because our, again, uh, for the reasons I'll explain very soon, <laughs> we struggle to empathize in a quantitative way we empathize in a qualitative way, but not in a quantitative way. For example, right now, 1.2 billion human beings 
live under the extreme poverty line. That should, I mean, if we had, if we had a profound sense of empathy, we'd be on the floor crying right now. But we don't, because we have no way of wrapping our head around that. And then the last one is, the last one is, when somebody hurts, somebody who belongs to the group that we associate with, we can do profound evil onto other human beings out of love for the people that we associate with. We sent those young men into World War I, not because they hated the other side, but for love of country. It was actually their ability to empathize with us, the civilians, their, pop, their family. It was actually out of, that, that's the scary thing. When you send someone out there to kill out of love, violence out of love is one of the most profound, uh, <laughs> profound shadows that lingers in our empathy cycle. So these are the kind of issues that we were dealing with right now with our empathy. It's, it's so incomplete and it has so many shadows to it. And remember the story that I was telling you. While somewhere between the last 200,000 years and 1.8 million years ago, somewhere along that stage, my theory is the environment, the physical environment, stopped becoming the primary threat and the real threat, right, or the perceived threat, were actually other human groups. It was actually other tribes who wanted your resources that became the source of danger. So what happened was there was group selection for ultra cooperativeness within the tribe, within the tribe, and this tribe wouldn't have been that big. So everybody in there you would have at least known by face. And you would have had a profound sense of connection with them. So you would have leapt to their defense. And the tribes that had the strongest sense of sociality within, strongest sense of altruism within, were better able to fight other tribes who didn't have that. But at the same time, if you can feel a profound sense of connection with this person here, and you have to kill a person who looks just like that. Because remember, if we all lived on an African savanna, we all looked alike. So what happens is you need social markers, social designators that set those people apart from you. We have, this tribe has one feather in their head, in their hair, that had two. Suddenly we have to come up with this ideology that dehumanizes them, erodes that empathy, and then we're able to do profound evil upon them. And part of that motivation isn't always that we hate them, it's because we love the people within our tribe. That's why all these extreme ideologies, although they're um, the, one of the reasons why they're so incredibly enticing and tempting is that they give you a profound sense of belonging, but it's always a belonging in relation to someone else who's not one of us. And this also helps us understand why we cannot think about empathizing with 1.2 billion people. And this also explains why it is that we can mobilize all of the resources of the nation to go out there and fight a war. We've had two world wars that we've mobilized so many resources, every scrap of resource to get this done in such a coordinated, sophisticated way. And yet right now, 57 million kids will not get a primary age education. That is a profound catastrophe, profound catastrophe. Yet we do see no mobilization of armies. We had, we've had issues of child soldiers for such a long time in certain regions of Africa, and yet when we're able to put a human face on it, Kony 2012, you guys remember that? Suddenly when there's a human face to it, those old, those old neural pathways can be enlivened. He is the problem. He is the enemy. And suddenly we can all be mobilized behind that. That's why we struggle with climate change, because there's no evil person out there for us to kill. That's not the source of the problem. So we have to make one if there's not there. So I will finish on this. There is a third level, there is a third level to empathy, a level that transcends our evolutionary limitations. I call this deep empathy. And deep empathy is walking past that homeless person and not only asking what he's feeling or what he's thinking, but also asking why is he there in the first place. You put yourself not only in his present moment, but to quote Foucault, in the, pr the history of his present moment. All the factors that led up to him being on the street. And then you have to ask the incredibly difficult question. The question that will subvert every notion you had of the in-group and the out-group. How have I been complicit in him being on the ground? How am I part of a system that ensures that people like him have to leave the light that they do like right now? 
That's why Christ's message of love thy enemy is so profound. Because what it does is it actually forces you to empathize with the other. You know the tribe with the two feathers? Love thy enemy, but I'm supposed to hate that person. He's not human. Suddenly it short circuits all those dehumanizing processes that are there to actually protect us. That's the, that's the sad thing about it. Because for us to do that profound evil to that other tribe, we needed to have that dampening effect on empathy. But even though we do it, why do we think we still have post-traumatic stress? Because that's still there. That empathy, that the goodness within us still wants to do better. And uh, I suppose the last question, this really goes to the heart of uh, Beyond Good Intentions, is we stand in front of that homeless person, and before we give that money, we ask a question, am I helping this person to help them, or am I helping this person to make me feel better? <laughs>